captain's log. Blacks rebellious, crew uneasy. Our linguist says their moaning is a prayer for death, ours and their own. Some try to starve themselves. Lost three this morning. Leapt with crazy laughter to the waiting sharks. Sang as they went under. The Atlantic slave trade represents the largest forced migration in human history. During the 18th century, more than six million West Africans were kidnapped and sold into slave labor across the ocean. The vast majority were taken to Brazil and the West Indies. Only about 4% were taken to British North America, but that 4% represented many thousands of Africans flooding into the American colonies. Before you have the plantation, before you have this new source of producing wealth, it doesn't make much sense to create a slave society. Slavery is a very porous institution. People are slaves and they slip out of slavery and they slip back into slavery. There are large numbers of people of European descent, of Native American descent, who are also held in a variety of systems of servitude. Once you get a slavery system, that movement, that porousness, that porousness, dis, you know, disappears. Now, initially, when Virginia was first founded, slavery was economically not viable because death rates in Virginia were so great that nobody lived very long. At that period, it made no economic sense to pay twice as much for a slave who might die within the same amount of time as an indentured servant who cost half as much. But by the second half of the century, when survival rates improved for both blacks and whites, then it started to make economic sense to buy an African slave. Well, may I say my life has been one scene of sorrow and of pain. From early days, I griefs have known, and as I grew, my griefs have grown. Olauda Equiano was an Igbo from the region of Benin, now known as Nigeria. At the age of 11, he was captured by Africans, wrenched from his family, and sold to European slavers seven months later. He endured a horrendous journey across the Atlantic to Barbados. He was then shipped to America. In Virginia, he was bought by a planter and placed among Africans from many different countries, none of whom spoke his language. He was eventually sold to an English captain of a tobacco ship from whom he bought his freedom on July 11, 1766. Equiano wrote a memoir of his experiences. Permit me, with the greatest deference and respect, to lay at your feet the following genuine narrative the chief design of which is to excite a sense of compassion for the miseries which the slave trade has entailed upon my unfortunate countrymen. Slavery had been practiced in Africa for centuries, largely as a function of tribal warfare. A variety of groups of people being sold, mainly prisoners of war, captives of war, um, people who had been condemned by the judicial system, people who voluntarily uh, went into slavery uh, out of poverty would be people who would be classified as slaves in the initial period, mainly from West Africa, from the region that is today sort of Mauritania down to what is today Angola, so that west and southwest portion of the continent is where most of the slaves originated. Slaves in Africa did no more work than other members of the community, even their master. The food, clothing, and lodging were nearly the same except that they were not permitted to eat with those who were born free. How different was their condition from that of slaves in the West Indies? As demand for labor in the New World increased, African slaves became a key commodity in the 18th century global marketplace. You had planters in regions of the New World desiring slaves. You had uh, merchants in Europe forming to meet that demand. And these merchants uh, established contacts with African merchants on the coast, all directed towards 
meeting a demand. They often preferred Africans from one region of the coast than from other regions of the coast. But since you were dealing with human beings, slaves were not manufactured in, in a factory. They were people who had to be rounded up, who had to be subjugated, who had to be captured in warfare. You couldn't just go to the coast and say, I want 50 of this kind of slave and I'll expect to get it. Uh, what happened on the coast depended on the vagaries of warfare, on crime, famine. Having been captured upon their own continent, the future slaves were forcefully marched to the western coast where African raiders sold them to European traders. In the process, the captives were wrenched from their families and imprisoned. Many were branded. They were subjected to intrusive body checks and thrown into dark dungeons or open pens. These factories, as the coastal prisons were called, were manned by Europeans. Those white men with horrible looks and red faces and long hair looked and acted in so savage a manner I had never seen among any people such instances of brutal cruelty. After this first nightmare, the prisoners underwent a second round of atrocities known as the Middle Passage. Slaves were packed like spoons into the hold of a ship, sometimes as little as three feet high. They spent weeks or even months in this manner, traveling thousands of miles across the Atlantic Ocean. I think we can say that the Middle Passage was unpleasant no matter what the conditions on particular slave ships. But we do know that a lot of, of ships had very horrible conditions in the sense that they packed the, uh, the slaves, the Africans, very tightly um, on these ships. I received such a salutation in my nostrils as I had never experienced before in my life and became so sick and low that I was not able to eat, for which they flogged me severely. The shrieks of the women and the groans of the dying rendered the whole scene of horror almost inconceivable. Could I have got over the nettings, I would have jumped over the side. Smallpox, dysentery, and dehydration ran rampant on board for the slaves were chained together with little room to move and virtually no sanitation. On average, 15% of the slaves on board any given ship died before it reached its destination. The more Africans you could pack on a ship, the more money you could make once you sold them. You also sort of took precautions by, by sort of piling more Africans into a ship that if you lost a certain amount of them, um, you would be, you'd still be able to make some profit uh, on the ones that were left over that you sold. Upon arrival in the West Indies, the captives were subjected to the scramble. On a signal given as the beat of a drum, the buyers rush at once into the yard where the slaves are confined and make their choice of that parcel they like best. The noise and clamor with which this is attended and the eagerness visible in the countenances of the buyers serves not a little to increase the apprehensions of the terrified Africans. In this manner, without scruple, our relations and friends separated, most of them never to see each other again. I had no person to speak to that I could understand. And in this state I was constantly grieving and pining and wishing for death rather than anything else. Some scholars suggest that African American culture started to develop on the slave ships when Africans from different regions were thrown together and had to start to develop a community of them against us, them against the people who were enslaving them. They had to start to find certain common denominators. They had to start to find certain common values. Uh, they had to start to develop uh, uh, a common language. And uh, so this, this process of recreating a culture, uh, creating a new culture began right away and continued to in the new world. In the New World, of course, in connection with Europeans, they started to borrow certain aspects of European culture which were incorporated in developing African-American culture. 
I would not use the term African-American culture. I would say we had several distinct African-American communities in that period. The experience of an African in the Chesapeake area, for example, would be very different from the experience of an African in, in the Carolinas or in the North. But I think that we can to a certain extent generalize and talk about the ways in which Africans utilize their traditions, their African traditions or cultural practices, kinship systems, uh, or even language uh, and their sense of identity to create some type of a culture that's of course influenced by their encounters with the larger European population and also with Native American population. All of these things are created in a reciprocal way. Uh, so that the very things that the slaves are creating are shaping uh, the lives of their owners, uh, shaping the lives of Native Americans, uh, shaping the lives even as uh, slaves themselves are being influenced uh, by influenced by this. It's interesting, you know, in places like South Carolina, African Americans were the majority of the people. I would never argue that South Carolina was African in its culture, but it certainly was influenced by uh, African cultural forms and it was influenced in, in, a, in a variety of ways, its language, its music, even in terms of world view, it, the kinds of crops it grew is very interesting. You know, South Carolina grew rice. One might ask this question, where, if you were from England, had you ever seen rice growing? Not a lot of rice grows outside of London. So that if you learn to grow rice, you learn to grow rice from people who have been growing rice for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, and those are African peoples. Although deprived of education and all but the barest necessities, many blacks managed to excel as craftsmen, cooks, inventors, and even physicians. Around 1750, a South Carolinian slave named Caesar was given his freedom and 100 pounds a year for life for discovering an antidote to poison. The formula, known as Caesar's Cure, was published in the Charleston Gazette and local almanacs for many years. But most slaves never reaped the rewards of their labor and that fact was not lost on them. We raise the wheat, shoot it, shoot it. They give us the corn, shoot it, shoot it. We bake the bread, shoot it, shoot it. They give us the crust, shoot it, shoot it. We sip the meal, shoot it, shoot it. They give us the hus, shoot it, shoot it. We peel the meat, shoot it, shoot it. They give us the skin, shoot it, shoot it. And that's the way, shoot it, shoot it. They take us in, shoot it, shoot it. Early Sunday morning. September 9th, 1739, covert defiance erupted into full-out rebellion in South Carolina. 20 miles south of Charleston on the Stono River Bridge, a group of slaves, mostly new arrivals from Angola, gathered, raided a store, seized the guns on the premises, and began marching south, burning plantations along the way. The Stono Rebellion developed because South Carolina was settled in a contested region that was claimed by Spain as well as England. And the Spanish in Florida at St. Augustine promised a sanctuary to slaves who escaped to the Spanish. Many of the slaves in early South Carolina were from the uh, Congo Angola region in Africa, which had been a Portuguese sphere of influence from the 15th century and many of those slaves spoke or had some knowledge of Portuguese, which was close enough to Spanish that they could understand. Uh, they got the word about this uh, sanctuary, and uh, in 1739, a group of slaves decided to go south. Along the way, the group of insurgents grew to a force of nearly 100. But when they stopped to beat drums to signal others to join them, they were intercepted by a white posse. Most of the rebels were summarily executed. But for nearly a decade after the Stono Rebellion, white South Carolinians instituted a ban on the importation of slaves, particularly those from the Congo-Angola region. The Lord's Prayer in Gullo has thought of remain basically almost the same, but it starts with, Our Father, art in heaven, all the way be thy holy and thy righteous name. Thy kingdom come, O Lord, let thy will and thy righteous would be done. On this earth as it done in your great heaven. Give me this day our daily bread. Gullah is a compendium of English and several West African languages, including Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba. Gullah 
is named for the Gola people of the Windward Coast of Africa, a group prominent among the slave populations of the Carolinas and Georgia. Gullah became the primary means of communication in South Carolina among slaves during the 18th century, providing a link between people of disparate backgrounds. It has been kept alive by some longtime residents of the islands dotting the coast of South Carolina and Georgia. I was born and reared in the Gullah culture, born and reared speaking Gullah. English is my second language. In school, the teachers would tell us, oh, don't, don't talk that way, don't speak like that. We would do our best when they tell us not to speak that way. And when we got back home, hey, we just lapsed back in it. Slavery had such a profound influence on both race and class because, number one, most black people were slaves. And that meant that people who were free and black were often treated in a very discriminatory fashion, a prejudicial fashion, treated in ways that people had come to associate with slaves. It influenced the way class was structured because so many, especially in the South, so many people who are doing heavy labor are slaves. And so it changed the character of the working class there because these people are not white, they're not becoming free, not like in the old slave uh, servant labor system. So uh, in both of those ways, it certainly changed the racial and class structure of the South. And especially, I think, the, race, the racial assumptions of all Americans. Englishmen were used to a class system. Uh, they were used to the idea that certain people would be at the top and certain people would be at the bottom, among which uh, Africans uh, just happened to, to be included. But by the middle of the 18th century, you had the development of a racial society in uh, America where all white people were supposed to be on top and all black people were supposed to be on bottom. As the institution of slavery pushed blacks to the bottom of the social and economic scale, whites were elevated. Plantation owners in the South became the wealthiest citizens in colonial North America. The South was a distinctive society by the middle of the 18th century. It was distinctive because of its commitment to slavery. It was distinctive also because in the eyes of the British, it was by far the most valuable part of the British North America. The British monarchy profited from slavery through the taxation of slave-grown products like rice, indigo, and tobacco. Likewise, merchants and shipping agents throughout the British colonies profited immensely from the exploitation of slaves. Without any compensation, kidnapped and enslaved Africans and their descendants in America had helped produce the greatest accumulation of capital Europe had ever known. By the mid-18th century, slavery had transformed the colony of Virginia into a territory dominated by a small class of wealthy elites who lived in pillared mansions, surrounded by elaborate gardens and acres of tobacco grown by slaves. Their tables were set with the finest silver. Their cellars brimmed with imported wines. Famous paintings adorned their walls and rare and expensive books filled the shelves of their first-rate libraries. The rich Virginians spare nothing in rendering their houses agreeable, both inside and out. This was the aristocratic world into which Thomas Jefferson, as well as James Madison, John Randolph, George Mason, George Washington, and many other future revolutionary leaders were born. Their wealth and social position offered them the best education available, the opportunity to serve in politics and the military, the leisure time to read, think, and debate the pressing questions of the day. One of Jefferson's earliest memories was a moving at the age of two from one of the family's estates to another. He was carried on a pillow by a slave on horseback. It was an apt metaphor for a generation held aloft by slavery, the same generation whose high ideals of freedom would one day rock the world. After 250 years of European settlement, North America was indeed a new world in the making. No longer the world unto itself it had been before Columbus, it was now home to a diverse population of Native Americans, 
African Americans, European immigrants, and their American-born descendants. In one way or another, all of these groups struggle for freedom, for power, for land, and for a place in the developing cultural landscape of America. About 1750, you can start to talk about an American identity. That is, Americans started to see themselves as distinct from Britain, from other groups in Europe. Uh, part of the reason that white Americans started to have this vision of themselves had to do with the fact that they were being shaped as a society by the forces, the, the cultural forces uh, related to Britain and other places in Europe, but also cultural forces related to various places in West Africa, various cultural forces of Native Americans. In the truest sense, these European Americans were beginning to react to and to become a part of uh, a society which was pieced together from a number of cultural experiences. For many, America had come to represent freedom the spaciousness of the land, the less stratified nature of society, even the proud bearing of Indian peoples, all of these symbolized freedom to colonial Americans and European observers. Freedom has always been, as far back as one goes in American history, a very central idea for all Americans. Many of those who came and emigrated to the early colonies were seeking freedom of one kind or another. Some were seeking religious freedom. Some were seeking the freedom that comes with escaping poverty. So from the very beginning, America has represented freedom in some ways from the oppression, from the social inequalities, religious persecutions of Europe. Now, on the other hand, of course, large numbers of Americans came without being free at all. They came as slaves. They didn't have the choice. They didn't decide that this was a place for them and what they found here was a very oppressive and inhuman system of slavery so the tension between freedom and slavery goes way back to the beginning of our history for native americans freedom seemed to decline in inverse proportion to the growth of the american colonies i think there's some great difference between the relationship of native american people to the british and to the french and to the spaniards Unquestionably, from a Native American perspective, the, uh, the French are by far the best because there is a grand intermarriage, a grand blending, very often, of French and Native American culture. The French have a, a real place for Native American people. They need Native American people in their plans for the New World because many of them are traders. They need Native American people to trade. And they also need Native American people in their contest versus the British because the French population is very small. In contrast, the, the British are much more standoffish, for lack of a better term. Uh, the Native American-British connection is much less complete, and it, it doesn't work nearly as well. And I think the, one of the major reasons is land, because the British are very interested in taking Indian land and converting it into a, quote, New England, in which there's no place at all for Native American people. For women, too, the level of freedom they enjoyed differed depending on time and place. Early in the settlement of a place, when things are not well developed, there is often more room for women to make choices and to um, uh, exercise their, what we would call freedom. In the early settlement of the Chesapeake, for example, in Maryland and Virginia, where there are far more men than there are women, we know that women can navigate the marriage market in a way that empowers them. Uh, they get to make choices about who they will marry. They begin to make demands about their responsibilities for their children and, and their control of, of their children. So there are periods in different places at different times in the colonial era where there is more a leeway for women, married or not, to make choices. As these societies become more modern, more literate, more 
tied into an international commercial network, we start to see the monopolization of power and authority uh, by men uh, exercised much more strongly. If you take modern standards and look at colonial America, you would find that very few people enjoyed freedom. Slaves obviously didn't enjoy freedom. Women had very, very few rights uh, in the law or politics or economic opportunity or education or anything like that. Large numbers of people were indentured servants who had given up their freedom for a, a period of time in order to work and get over here. So when we talk about freedom, we're mostly talking about adult free white men. But still, if you take them, there's a heck of a lot more of them in percent in proportions to the population in colonial America than there was in Europe at, at that same time. So this rough condition of greater equality among the free population did help to generate a sense that freedom was a sort of uh, common characteristic of American society, not something just for the uh, elite. As tyrants and dictators know, freedom begets a desire for more freedom. In 1750, most American colonists were relatively content with their lot. But soon the winds of freedom would blow stronger than ever across British America.